Hey everybody, this is Mike Bruce with Life Starts with Food Health Coaching, and I am here with uh, with a friend, Jordan Riding. I think Jordan, we let, we met last December, didn't we? We did, yeah. Uh, yeah, so friends getting together. Yeah. Yep. Previous a previous uh, a previous guest, Dan Dennehy, the race car driver. Um, we met at his house, and you and I hit it off pretty well. They are good matchmakers. They're um, they're really cool people, <laughs> and um, I I just told Dan the other day. I said, Dan. I need you on again, just because I like talking to you. So, <laughs> um, but Jordan is a super knowledgeable guy. He's willing to experiment on himself, and he's willing to try whatever whatever's going on out in the market at the moment. He's he's just he just goes after it, which is really cool. Um, he is originally from San Diego. His wife, who is just the sweetest thing, um, so pretty and just so strong. You can tell looking at her that she is just fit, but you know it's more than just fit strong. You know. Um, you guys both have an amazing love for Jesus Christ and, uh, and it's hard not to be drawn to you just for that alone. Um, but go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, Jordan and, and, uh, and your website. I do have it up here. I'll show it to everybody at the end of the, end of the, uh, the interview here, but, um, uh, transplant from, from San Diego to, to Pittsburgh and you, um, were smart enough to jump on a really terrific name for a, uh, fitness business. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, you know, 2017 decided to leave San Diego, move to Pittsburgh to kind of just figure out what I wanted to do in the fitness industry. And I was thinking at the time of going and applying, like taking the GRE, applying for um, physical therapy school um, at University of Pittsburgh. So that's kind of what drew me to Pittsburgh in the beginning. And then I just started really diving into the fitness side of things, got really into a, a couple local gyms, you know, teaching group fitness classes, like 100 people at a time, working with high volume of clients, like doing fitness consultations and um, nutrition consultations with clients. Um, and I was at gyms that had 500 personal training client members, and I was one of two uh, trainers, right? And I did that here in Pittsburgh. I did that in Philadelphia for a year as well, um, where my wife and I ended up getting married. We met in Pittsburgh, married in Philadelphia. And then I realized, man, I'm spending way too much time at the gym working on other people. <laughs> um, and I feel like I wasn't making the impact I wanted to make um, in each one of their lives because it's just fitness is so much more than just like, hey, here's your macros and let's work out. Um, and it's really a life. It's a whole lifestyle. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're able to do that. It's hard to do that for 500 people yeah. um, in an intimate level. And not that the gym I was currently working at doesn't have a great system, but it just wasn't for me, wasn't like exactly aligned with what I wanted when it comes to, you know, I wanted to be with my wife more. Um, so, and having my, my bachelor's in kinesiology, I felt like, man, I have so much more extra knowledge that I'm not being able to use um, when I'm, you know, doing group fitness and things like that. So I started Steel Body Fitness, uh, completely online, um, health coaching, um, you know, business to be able to customize programs for my clients. And I'm working with a way smaller, more intimate group of clients. I have a like, few handfuls of clients. I have 20 clients at the moment. Um, and it's being able to take them from not just a to b or a to c but from a to z and being able to say like all right like focusing on everything from sleep to how they um, navigate like holiday season right now we just had a group call with my clients yesterday i'm like hey what's our you know strategy for thanksgiving mm -hmm. and what we're going to do there um and of course along the way i've you know I've had my cpt since um 2014 which is my certified personal trainer since 2014 and um, my bachelor's in kinesiology and I'm a certified nutrition coach through precision nutrition. So I'm just kind of always been, like you mentioned, I experiment on myself. I'm always just kind of just trying to find and stay up to date on the most, you know, what's going on when it comes to fitness and nutrition and, um, specifically with nutrition, cause that's a ever changing field mm -hmm. of information. Yeah. And a lot of miss, like a lot of smoke screens out there too, when it comes to that. So. Yeah, definitely. And we'll dive into that some too. Um, something that I find really interesting, and I could be wrong on this, so please correct me if I am. Um, I find it's like two type of people that go into the health field. It's either 
like someone like me who had a lot of weird health issues and still, I still battle. We were just talking before we got on. I still battle with trying to figure some of these things out because as my body heals, something new pops up to the surface. Um, and that's just consistently how it's been going for nine or 10 years now. Um, and then you, I don't think you had any health issues, did you? No, I mean, I had a pretty bad knee injury. And okay. that kind of launched me into what I'm doing, like why I majored in kinesiology, why yeah. I was on the rehab route um, up until just 2017. Yeah. It was very much like, you know, I worked, my one of my first jobs was in a physical therapy office as a PT aide. Um, so I'm very much into like how, like when it comes to joint health, Mm -hmm. I think that's probably like how to design programs for people that not only makes you um, build muscle and lose body fat, but makes you feel better and yeah. move more functionally and fit together better um, is kind of just my little like niche, I guess, or what, what I really geeked out on for like six years. <laughs> that's so that's really cool. So I didn't know that you actually had an injury. So that's uh, a lot of the guys that get into fitness in the in the training side or in the kinesiology side, they did have injuries. And that makes a lot of sense now. Um, I'm always blown away when someone's someone's like, yeah, I became a nutritionist. And it's like, okay, why? Well, I just wanted to. Like, there's no backstory. So they don't even have like skin in the game. They don't even know that the things they're being taught in most standard nutritional, uh, in the nutritionist, nutritioning, sorry, in the education for that kind of work, they don't even understand that it, it might not be right for, for most people. <laughs> they just, yeah. they just learn that, Hey, here's food and we'll eat it. And it's, it's like, well, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's like, I wish it did. Um, cause I love cake and I used to eat cake every day of my life in the summer times. Cause my mom was a cake decorator. And, uh, but that was probably the reason I had a broken metabolism. So <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's funny when it comes to like, I guess looking back on what really got me into this whole field and when it comes to nutrition and fitness it's i started wrestling my like in middle school and wrestling is a sport where you have to maintain a certain weight yeah uh, it's very like i was extremely lean back then still am lean but like not as lean as i was when i wrestled and i was doing paleo before paleo was cool i was doing like higher fat diet before keto was even a thing yeah um, i think it was still a cancer treatment back then <laughs> um, <laughs> and i was doing these things just based off what i learned in biology class and what was working well for me and a lot what allowed me to perform best in the wrestling ring or the wrestling um mat without like while maintaining like the weight I wanted for my weight class. And it was just like a strategy that I kind of stumbled upon. Yeah. And when I had my knee injury and I started, you know, really like doing physical therapy and realizing that like the, the mental depression that goes along with not being able to walk for long periods of time and losing muscle mass and mm -hmm. being an athlete who can no longer be an athlete kind of things like that. Yeah. Um, and my eventual return to wrestling and then wrestling in college was this is a that was like the complete journey that I went through um and then so of course like I I had a, whole, a few physical therapists just say like why don't you like you could you know do this because you're like, I would always ask questions and I was just one of those patients that it finally clicked for me I was like oh I have to do this for myself like they yeah. can't fix me um and now as a coach I feel like I do the same for my clients as I empower them to do the work and fix themselves yeah. and figure things out instead of having to rely on someone else to fix it for them. Cause it doesn't really work that way. And it is the most, as a coach, it's the most addictive thing when somebody else has an aha moment. Like I will say a thousand words trying to get one word to make somebody, to give somebody that aha moment. You know, it's like you just to, to have that skill set to, um, to be able to read people, appropriately can really make a, a champion of a health coach, I think, because it just takes one aha moment. Um, but speaking of, I want to show everybody something real quick. You were talking about staying lean in high school, right? Um, yeah. So I found this real fast. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's you, man. That's like, I, that was me like freshman year of college into a year after college. Wow. So, I mean, that's an incredible transformation. Um, and you're probably what I mean. It might be 15 pound difference in body weight, huh? Uh, yeah, it was more like 20 pound difference in body yeah. weight. Yeah, but so so people think that like 
I mean, 20 pounds is a lot. 20 pounds of muscle is a lot. But... When, I, when I'm doing the math, so like 145 to 175. So wow. That's, that's, wow. That's a, that's and you're point. shorter than I am. So you have, you definitely have a decent amount of mass on, on yourself. And, uh, I, I'm like a buck 60, buck 65 at any given time. Um, uh, because of my gut issues, I don't necessarily maintain mass all that well, but I, I stay strong. I stay lean and strong, but I would like to have just a touch more mass on me. But, and, and so speaking of, that's probably a good, a good segue here, getting into the first topic, which is greasing the groove. Um, and this, this was a technique that I used to get myself up over 25, uh, 25 pull-ups in a row. And it got myself up to, um, a set of three for a hundred pound pull up, meaning I hung a hundred pounds from my body and did this. So, uh, let's go into this, man. I want, I want to just rip into this one and really find out what greasing the groove is and what, what benefits it has. Yeah. So when, after graduating college, my next little, like, well, not, I wouldn't say after graduating college, cause I was teaching kettlebell in college and doing a lot of calisthenics in college because I was being a wrestler and having I had a small flare up of my knee. I was like, I want to do pistol squats because that if I can do pistol squats, I would feel really confident about my knee. So I started training for pistol squats and locked those. Um, I could always do like full bridges when you like, you know, did the matrix essentially came back because the wrestling is just what we did all the time. Um, things like that. I got really into body weight training. And so, and then being a, a lot really into kettlebell too, the kind of like godfathers of kettlebell training and the godfathers of um, body weight training are these guys that tr like tokens like grease the groove essentially um and the, it's the whole idea of like if you're so one of the guys great book and his name is like an alias because it's uh he was he was an inmate like in prison and he wrote these books um so he oh. keeps his name secret and his whole philosophy is like, hey, if you're in prison, you can't work out to failure because you're going to get beat up once you're like, you're going to, you know, if you're sore, you can hardly move. People are going to target you. Is this um, the prison fitness stuff I've heard about before? Just Yeah. So um, it's called Convict Conditioning is one of his books. And he has like two volumes of it now. Um, I, I really need to read the second volume, but the his whole philosophy is like, man, like if you're being in prison, like you need to be strong, you need mm -hmm. to be functional. Uh, you really only have your body weight. You can't go to the gym and you have all the time in the world though, essentially. And you can't work out the failure. You can't get super sore in prison and expect to be able to defend yourself at any given time. So he kind of just gravitated towards greasing the groove. And it's not something that he invented because like Russian Spetsnaz, like, they're you know special forces they train the mm -hmm. same way but with kettlebells and body weight yeah um, and it's the same thing it's like if you're in the battlefield you can't be sore and tired and then get mm -hmm. attacked in the middle of the night and not be able to grab your weapon in time and things like yeah. that charles peliquin so, was always a big advocate of greasing the groove and i think that's actually where i learned it from yeah um so there's a lot of you know it's kind of more in mixed martial arts too different um groups like different gyms are picking up more of a grease the groove strategy rather than a like knock your knock you out every week strategy yeah the whole jujitsu um, like let's be dead <laughs> two days a week you know yeah and it makes a lot of sense because you can make huge strength gains like you mentioned get up to 25 pull-ups and be able to do weighted um, pull-ups and mm -hmm. you know without having to actually like pushing to failure in every workout is not necessarily always beneficial. It causes a lot of stress in the body, yeah. which you have to dig yourself out of that stress. You have to recover. Um, and if you, you know, I've seen people who are just getting into fitness do hit workouts, dig themselves into a huge, um, like huge, um, just divot in the ground when it comes to recovery yeah. and then not know what to do nutrition wise and have a busy schedule and not be able to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not recover and lose muscle mass as a result and hurt their metabolism and yeah. things like that. So greasing the groove, not only is it a way to, it's like a really functional way of training, but it's just a, makes recovery really easy and it allows you to come back stronger for sure the next day. Sure. And so uh, we have one question about something you said right before this. Uh, Kim wants, to, and this is my wife, Kim, by the way, uh, she's awesome. done pistol squats. Yeah. Holy cow, right? And I, I used to do pistol squats in the 
kind of a Ted Naiman style where I was doing, um, I would do eight one leg, eight the other other leg, and immediately go back and forth, back and forth, and just go to full exhaustion. I would be holding onto a, the side of the door to pull myself up to finish them out, mm -hmm. um, attempting to do just like a five minute workout every other day. Horrible. But I couldn't do a single pistol squat a couple years ago. So go ahead, explain what that is. Yeah, I mean, a pistol squat is just a one-legged body weight squat, essentially. And I can do it with a little bit of weight now. Man. Um, but it's one of those things where it really, your knee goes to your toes. Like yeah. your hips go, all, your butt goes all the way down to your calf. Uh, it's a and full range of motion squat on one leg. Yeah, you're literally holding. So you got one leg down and you're holding the other leg forward. And your goal is to not touch that other leg, essentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's what well, I see it as just like if you can do a pistol squat, you have full mobility in your knees and hips and your yeah. ankle, which is really, really good for injury prevention. So how would we grease the groove to work up to a pistol squat? Yeah, so for, I mean, for that, essentially, I would say if you're a very, very beginner, um, you would just be trying to master body weight squats in a way that actually works well for you and reinforces strong low back muscles and that range of military, like the range of motion and mobility. Yeah. So being able to do like holding on to the back of a chair and squat and do, you know, 20 reps with mm -hmm. perfect form counting, you know, two seconds on the way down, pause for one second, at the very bottom, come two seconds up, pause and squeeze all your muscles at the top and repeat 20 times. Yeah. Um, it's going to, be really boring and methodical or like you can think of it as like a meditation yeah and yeah. that's like the style of training you do that one set and then you eat breakfast and then you do dishes and then after that you do your second set right and then and, your goal is to get like seven sets in a day and yeah. you're getting 140 reps that way and that's going to make a difference and they're all perfect reps yeah and here's the thing is that we do have people that that watch this i know that that might not even be able to do five of those so what I've recommended to people, get get inside a doorway. So you have the frame at your back and you can hold the frame in front of you and use that and just squat, use your back sliding along it. You don't even have to go more than a couple inches, but you do that, you do two, three of those, go walk away, come back. Every time you go through a doorway, do two or three of those every time. Yeah. And let's be honest, we don't walk through that many doorways in a day, but <laughs> but that's that's one way for somebody who's even even has more trouble. I work with a lot of people at the office that are that are in their seventies and eighties, and they're just trying to keep mobile. Um, I'll have them even put a chair in the doorway, so they can still hold on to that. So um, it, you can start at any level, and um, so yeah, and go ahead. When it, when it comes to squat progressions, I think one of the first ones, even the one like the, even before holding on to a chair is just to like essentially being able to sit down and stand up as a squat. Mm -hmm. So being able to sit down to a chair and stand back up and work your way up to getting, ideally you should be able to do 40 perfect reps of sitting down, standing up in a row Yeah. before yeah. you go to like an assisted full squat. Right. Yeah. And then same thing, you should be able to do like 40 assisted full squats, perfect form without breaking a sweat before you move on to unassisted full yeah. squats. And then and I'll be honest, that's not all, if I haven't been active, if I'm coming home from vacation where it was a lazy vacation, which usually we don't have a lazy vacation, it's a lot of walking and stuff. But if I'm squatting and I haven't done body weight squats for a long time, 40, I go real fast. I'm, I'm not doing super slow, but 40 wears me down and it causes some burning, man. It really does. And that's coming from a guy who's pretty fit, pretty active. Um, so, so like, it's okay if it takes you a few weeks to build up to these things, guys. Or a month. Yeah. <laughs> um, the the book that convict conditioning um, that I really recommend if you're just kind of like a want to dive down a rabbit hole on body weight training, you stay at like a progression for a month, two months. Wow. And it's very just like, you know, it's go through, you know, earn your stripes kind of thing, and mm -hmm. it's not like try and essentially there's. It's too many people try and lift weights in the gym, for example, that are way heavier than they can control and they get no, almost no benefit. Yeah. Right. And with if they would have started with the light weights and done it right, they could have been at the heavier weights and been controlling it um, in a quicker time. Right. Sure. It's the same thing with body weight training. It's like you got to humble yourself, go to the beginning, 
really make sure that you understand your body understands the very beginning moves, which might seem boring, like sitting under a chair and standing up, <laughs> but um, with tempo. Um, but eventually you get to a point where you can do a pistol squat and it's like your first attempt at doing a pistol squat, you actually do the pistol squat because Man, you work I, your way up to it. I fell over my first five attempts, just fell over. So, um, <laughs> so how about for somebody like Lori, she has, she has knee problems and she's wanting to be able to squat better um, or at all. Right. So I know she can get up and down from chairs. I've seen her do that plenty of times, but, uh, uh, but you know, maybe she doesn't want to have to hold onto the chair or the table every time she's standing up. Um, what do you recommend for knee pain? Um, so, I mean, I, I used to have knee problems too, cause I, I tore my meniscus. I had surgery. I used to deal with knee pain. I was, you know, kind of just for a while, I believe that oh, knee pain after surgery is normal. Um, and it's just something that you're gonna have to deal with, but then through training and just through making sure I'm taking care of my body, I am completely pain free. And like, I'm, pretty confident. Like I want to go back to jujitsu in January and things like that. So, um, there is hope when it comes to knee pain. Um, and I've also worked with centers that I used to work for like in California who were older and also had knee pain and same thing. Like there, there is, there is hope. Yeah. Um, it's not something you have to be stuck with, but it is very much like pain is not always a bad thing when it comes to training. Um, so there's this, misconception that if you squat and it hurts to just not do it anymore and that's like the worst advice ever and really it's like all right yes like you don't have full range of motion right now maybe there's a little bit of inflammation in the knee um, there's some scar tissue that maybe will need to be moved around or broken up depending on how it, what's going on in your situation and we have to just do the squats or the leg extensions or the um, different, like maybe, maybe it's a toe touch or a heel tap, um, different exercises that will cause a little bit of swelling that will cause a little bit of pain in the moment, but it's acute pain. You, you know, ice it down, heat it back up, stretch, and then repeat again. Mm -hmm. um, and over time you build up a more resilient joint. So it's one so, of those things like avoiding pain is not the answer. If that makes yeah. sense. So maybe, maybe sitting down on a chair, and just doing a leg extension, just up and down. Yeah. That could be, so that could be, uh, Lori, that could be a great way to get started is just, and I'm, I know she is an active lady. She's, she's, uh, she's a lot of fun. I was in a referral group with her for a long time. And um, I just stopped going this year because, wow, waking up at 7 a.m. every Tuesday morning ruined the rest of my week when I work very late nights. Um, so, but I, it, so many blessings came out of that group. Um, so she's saying hers is from my, uh, arthritis and fibromyalgia. Um, and same, it's going to, the same thing factors in, you still need to get that range of motion. You need to break up whatever, uh, scar tissue, whatever kind of, uh, aches and pains you have in there. Um, but especially for fiber, for, for arthritis and fibromyalgia, you should not be eating a single grain at all. You should probably cut dairy as well. Those two things are super inflammatory when you have an autoimmune issue, which arthritis and fibromyalgia both are autoimmune. I miss you too, Lori. She just said, it. we miss you. So, um, but yeah, if you, if you want to reduce pain, man, talk to my mom. She has both arth arthritis and fibromyalgia. And when she cuts grains and dairy for an extended period of time, you wouldn't even know. I mean, she's, she has what we call the Shirley shuffle and it was from so much pain for so long and she just kind of shuffled along. And then all of a sudden she's cleaned up her diet and man, she's back to hustling around with the grandkids and stuff. So yeah, there's a lot to say about in, like just inflammation in the body when it comes to nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's definitely right on. I agree with that. I think everyone's different. So, you know, some people can get away with eating certain things, maybe like get away with the wrong word, but some people just can, their body is more like you can eat certain things and it's not going to give the same effect. Right. Sure. As some other people and it's just genetics and then there's also you know a lot of its lifestyle from earlier on that can you know catch up as well and it's mm -hmm. just it's it's interesting rabbit holes to go down when it comes to yeah. information and um, and we plan yeah. on going down that rabbit hole but let's hit <laughs> let's hit up kettlebells before we move off of movement because i don't know a lot about kettlebells i've swung them i've done uh turkish get-ups i've used them for presses I don't know much about kettlebell workouts, but man, when I see someone who just goes all in kettlebells for like a month or two, their body change is unbelievable. 
Yeah. And so I love kettlebell. I think I got in not arguments, but like I've had so many people who are in the fitness industry who are personal trainers or strength conditioning coaches. Uh, I think strength conditioning coaches, most of them actually like kettlebells for the most part, but Mm -hmm. um, people would always ask me like, Oh, what is the one piece of equipment? If you were to have a piece of equipment to work out, like what's the one piece of equipment that you would need? And mine is like a pair of kettlebells or a kettlebell (laughs) Um, and not even like super heavy, like, you know, 35 pounds for me. And I'm an advanced weightlifter and body weight kind of athlete. And 35 pounds is like, it's enough for me to maintain and even build a little bit more strength. Yeah. And you don't need to go much heavier than that. Although there is a benefit to it for certain exercises. Right. And the thing is kettlebell training. It's a lot like martial arts. It's, you know, in martial arts, it's not about um, being necessarily like, I don't know, in, in the weight room, for example, if you're like a power lifter, you're going to measure your progress by how much you can lift. Kettlebell's not that way. Kettlebell is very much like you're learning an art form. Mm-hmm. You're, it's more about like how smooth is the kettlebell moving? How fluid are you in the movements? How, what, like, are you doing a, the array of move motions to make sure that your body can functionally move right. in different areas? And are, are you having functional strength? And I think kettlebell is, is the tool when it comes to weighted functional strength yeah. other than just grappling someone. And that's where so many mixed martial artists use kettlebells in their training. It's a yeah. staple. Yeah. And I will say uh, kettlebell is unforgiving. So you pay for it if you're not smooth, if you don't have your actual technique down. Like you do a kettlebell clean, you do 10 of those in a row and you don't have your technique down, you have bruised wrist. You know, you're just in pain. Um, it's It could be bad, you know, and and if you're doing a Turkish getup and you got that kettlebell straight above you when you're trying to get up off the ground, if you don't have your shoulder and your posture and everything just perfect, you're going to hurt yourself. Um, so you got to keep that weight real light until you start figuring it out. And when I was uh, when I was at a uh, uh, gym for a solid a solid year, I was going to a gym having uh, uh, small group classes and stuff. We were doing tr- uh, kettlebells and everything all with like we would, it was something different every week, every couple couple weeks we'd switch things up. Um, man, I, I learned so much about how to hurt myself with a kettlebell, (laughs) but I never once went above 35 pounds on that. And that was, that was pushing it most of the time for me. Um, and I was incredibly fit right then. I was working out three times a week with a, with an instructor in a group class, a group setting of 10 people. So we were really hands-on. Everybody really pushed each other. Um, it was me and a bunch of, a bunch of moms. It was awesome. They kicked my butt. Um, but the kettlebells, I mean, half of them were doing 20, 25 pounds. Um, if I was doing 25 or 30, they were doing 25. It was incredible. So um, it's it, it doesn't matter what gender you are. The kettlebell can can make sissies of all of us or it can really show how functional we are. Yeah. And that's the thing about kettlebell. It's like it's, again, leaving the ego aside and pouring yourself more into the art of using the kettlebell the right way. And yes, there are like, so there's a lot of people who out there. So like, there's two schools of kettlebell, two primary schools of kettlebell. There's the American style kettlebell and then there's the Russian style kettlebell, right? Um, and so Pavel, his last name, I'm not going to try and pronounce. Tatsui? Um, <laughs> Tatsui. Tatsui. Or, yeah. Um, Pavel is like the godfather of kettlebell um, when it comes to RKC with like the Russian kettlebell um side of things and he's like the one who kind of made a lot of the training protocols for the russian like special forces Mm -hmm. that and a lot of other countries have adopted as well um and it very much is like you humble yourself you use small weight you don't train till exhaustion or to failure you use the grease the groove method because you're making sure that every motion is perfect in its quality Mm -hmm. And when it comes to like the American style, it's like, you know, go as heavy as you can and you're not using the same motions because you can't do it with that, those motions. And you're kind of doing it as if it's a dumbbell, but it's a kettlebell. And I think that's where a lot of people don't like kettlebells is like, oh, they're not as good as dumbbells because you like they're you can't use them the way you use a dumbbell. And it's like they're missing the point is there's this whole different array of motions that don't exist with dumbbells that kettlebells can do. And it's 
you know, you can, when it comes to a kettlebell swing, it's a really great way. If you have knee pain, if you master the kettlebell swing, um, you can get all the benefits of a jump squat without ever having to leave the ground from a kettlebell swing, you know? So it's really great. And then if you go heavy with your kettlebell swings, now you're getting all the benefits of a heavy deadlift, but for like a fourth or a fifth of the weight. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really awesome. So kettlebells are, are great tools. It's just, they, again, it's like a martial art. You start as a white belt and you have to work your way up. And I think a lot of us think of kettlebells as all there is to do is a swing. Yeah. Right. So like, what are the, (laughs) it's a great move, but like, what, um, I mentioned the Turkish get up. That's, that's like, I would assume that's a very advanced move. Um, and uh, people don't even think of just, you know, a kettlebell squat, just grab a hold of the sucker right here and squat down. Um, but what are some different moves you can do with kettlebells? There's a lot, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's a huge amount of moves. Yeah. So first off, there's like so many variations of a kettlebell swing and all of them have great benefits. Um, I love doing twisting kind of like swings. So starting from the left of your body and finishing overhead to the right and like different like windmill style motions that they work. I mean, when you swing, you're working your, your lower back, you're working your legs. And then when you're in that twisting motion, you're really mm-hmm. activating your core, your obliques. And if you're finishing overhead, you're finishing with shoulder muscles. And you're when you finish like a snatch, for example, um, you go to straight arm overhead. Um, you really open up your shoulders and create strength, that full range of motion and your shoulder mobility. Like I slept on my shoulder funny. Right. And you would think a snatch, which is like, you know, throwing a weight back behind you at full extension would be like the worst thing or the worst yeah. feeling after sleeping on your shoulder the wrong way. Um and it actually fixed my shoulder. It made me feel oh, better. After my workout, I felt like 100%. And it's because you're tightening your infraspinatus and all these different muscles that make up your rotator cuff. And you're reinforcing good posture with the kettlebells that it just makes your body feel good when you do it the right way. Mm-hmm. And it's like when you do a kettlebell workout the right way, you should feel better than when you started. Uh, not worse. So like, yeah. And you talked about how you can get bruises and things like that. Like I don't get a single bruise from using kettlebells and I'll do like hundreds and hundreds of reps, um, snatches, cleans, and all kinds of stuff and never get bruises. It's just because you have to, again, feel the motion, Mm -hmm. but yeah, a clean is a great move to build up, you know, just all over, like taking a weight from the ground and racking it into your, you know, your shoulder and chest or taking it overhead. Um, you can do, of course, standard just bodybuilding style moves like a bent over row or a front squat or overhead squats and like which is more like olympic style lifting moves um, with a kettlebell but it can be offset like you use one kettlebell and you're doing an overhead squat you're now Mm -hmm. having to have a lot more stabilizer muscles involved um doing like rdls on single legged rdls with the kettlebell it, it feels just a lot better i feel like then with the dumbbell um, because of the way the kettlebell is weighted, yeah. it's very R- RDL just... Russian deadlift. Yeah, Romanian. Romanian, Romanian okay. Romanian so that, deadlift, that's... Which is like a lot. It's like basically like touching your toes at gym class. It's like it's a like stretch in the back of the leg. Yeah, it's like yeah. a stiff leg. Uh, deadlift versus a conventional deadlift, which is almost like a squat. Um, but you're just picking ground dead weight off the floor. Mm-hmm. So there's that's that difference there. But when it comes to kettlebell too, being able to put one move into another so and make flows kind of like yoga flows almost but with the kettlebell one they look really cool but two um they're super functional and it's a way to do more like train for power so if you're an athlete for example if you're able to take a kettlebell off the ground swing it overhead into a snatch and then go into a racked position and swing it to the other side of your body, do a windmill, press it overhead, and then do a lunge and then Mm -hmm. repeat. Um, You're getting a lot of different motions and you're learning how to be more athletic because you're going from, if you're a wide receiver, for example, and you have to, in football, you have to like, you know, fake someone out, sprint real quick, then extend your hands. Um, You can't get that kind of motion weighted with dumbbells. It does, you're going to hurt yourself doing that. (laughs) <laughs> it, it is. It's interesting when we look at the way we work out. It is nothing like the way we actually move in life. You know, um, it. Well, the way we should be moving in life. If we had, 
an actual society that wasn't involving computers and chairs all day. But uh, you're, you know, you're grabbing stuff. Let's just think of shopping. You're grabbing stuff up here. You're putting it down in the buggy. You're twisting. You're doing this all day. You're taking a hay bale, tossing it up onto a tractor. Like in no way do we just go. No one does that, you know, and that's all working out ever it is. Um, but I, I do love the types of workouts we would do that were similar to kettlebell or similar or using um, dumbbells even that were technical and it involved, you had to be technical because you're doing like, you know, you're doing um, a 20 minute EMOM, you know, every minute on the minute you're doing like um, a clean overhead uh, press and then a, a thruster, you know, like a body weight squat or something. So uh, with like push-ups involved. And if you don't do those just right with the right amount of weight, with the right technique, you're not making it past three minutes. So <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the thing when it comes to certain sports, uh, well, all sports really, but like wrestling and jujitsu and like MMA, when you have to grapple, um, it's very much being able to understand like your opponent's body weight and move in a way that's functional and like doesn't waste a lot of energy. Right. Mm -hmm. And kettlebell, you get to train that way, which is yeah, really cool. That's neat. Well, so that that's awesome information about kettlebell. Let's move on to the last thing we kind of had um, in mind to talk about today. Um, just finding what kind of foods actually work for your gut. And maybe like you, I think you used the word smoke screen earlier. Um, kind of the smoke screen that we're given about what actually is healthy and what what actually is food. You know, what existed on this planet okay. for for you know, no, more than 50 years. Right. Um, yeah. so let's, let's, uh, I, I don't know what direction you really want to go with this, but I, I, uh, I love hearing from you in any direction. So let's, let's go yeah. into this. I mean, it's such a wide open thing. So, I mean, first off, there's so much, I think, bad research or old research that was just half done or not done very well. That's kind of made our current dietary guidelines in, in our country. <laughs> um, and we can see now fast forward from the 70s to now, we can see a huge like increase in diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and also something new called metabolic syndrome um, that wasn't really talked about in the last 20 years until now. And like, and a bunch of other stuff, which I mean, metabolic syndrome essentially is the same thing as um, getting diabetes and obesity and heart disease is just a different pathway of getting mm -hmm. it. And it's because we've now changed the way um, uh, we eat. And now we're getting the same health issues, but in a different pathway. Um, and it's actually going through the gut. I feel like it's, you know, we're destroying our, our gut microbiome. We're destroying the way um, our body uses cortisol and different hormones to get, um, you know, be able to actually get nutrition from our food. And it, as a result, we're gaining fat and then that's changing our hormones even more. And mm -hmm. then we're getting heart disease, diabetes, everything else. And it's just like this, like we were eating too much or we were eating too much sugar and then getting it. And then now we're eating too little actually and eating the wrong things and getting the same result. And so it's like, there's a lot of, I feel like frustration uh, if you're someone who's been maybe following the different crazes of like, you know, the war on fat and like fat free foods. And then you didn't get the result you wanted. And then you're jumping from diet to diet now. Um, it's just a, I, I feel sorry, you know, and it's just kind of like, there's so much misinformation out there and it's actually a really easy fix. But like you mentioned, it's knowing what's food and what's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and I always tell people like, did this thing exist? A thousand years ago, like di just did it exist? And people don't even understand that, like we weren't eating canola oil, right? No, but like that would never make sense to them. And um, and I, I I'm sure you know these these stats, but the standard American today, seventy five to eighty five percent of their calories are coming from vegetable and seed oils. That sounds super healthy. They didn't exist. <laughs> they didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and then we were told that like animal fat is bad for us. And my favorite thing to tell people is if animal fat or uh, you, you fill in the blank, if animal fat, if red meat, if this or that, if this was so bad for us, how did we survive as a human species? So, um, but yeah, go, I, cause I know you have some things to say about, about PUFAs and canola oil and all these things. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you can look at, there's a study that just came out in 2018, um, which is like the co complete opposite of the studies that were coming out in the seventies, essentially where the seventies, they would just looked at like, Oh, like swapping out saturated fat for the PUFAs, the, you know, polyunsaturated fats, the seed oils lowers your cholesterol. And that's all we care about because we want you to have low cholesterol. And they totally ignored like all the people in Italy who have high cholesterol, but are super healthy. Mm -hmm. um and just said oh in america you have to have low cholesterol and yeah it's just like okay people what? aren't healthy as a result yeah uh, we got worse actually as a result and there's you know because there's so many things like smart balance and like all this junk that we're being being fed and we're getting rid of the animal fat the saturated fat and things like that um which is just i think it wreaks havoc on our hormones and on our gut health and like like you mentioned, that's a staggering stat that like majority of food and calories come, is coming from that source is just yeah. mind boggling. Yeah. So it just didn't even exist in like, we should be getting most of our calories from, from meat, like cal actual calories. It doesn't mean your whole plate has to be meat, but your calories should be from animals. Um, and then yeah. whatever vegetables and, and other things you like to fill that up with, um, even honey, things like that, things that existed for all of time. Um, to, to fill it up with something that never existed, how in the world is our body supposed to have a clue what to do? Yeah. And it's so like, if you think, you know, just go back to, I think paleo was on the right track when they first came around to be, and it was just like, all right, does this food, like, like you said, like, is this, where does this food come from? Is it, you know, is it normal to be eating this in such a high quantity and seed oils is one of those things that we didn't have an ability to get it until you know, recently really, mm -hmm. and the high qualities that we're using it. And for some reason it's deemed as healthy and it's put into all processes, like processed prepackaged food. It's put into, it's really cheap. So, I mean, yeah. every fast food restaurant in the nation is using seed oils. Uh, in and out used to use peanut oil, but they recently switched to sunflower oil, which it's like, all right. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, like there's, I think there's one restaurant that I know of that uses chicken fat to cook stuff in now. Wow. Um, so they're a very progressive restaurant. Is that a local restaurant or what? It's in San Diego. Uh, wow. It's called the Crack Shack, but they have amazing yeah. chicken and their French fries and everything like that are cooked in chicken fat. Like terrific. It's, yeah. So it's a little, it's a, it's definitely an improvement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not like I would still go with lard or tallow, um, but, or I would go with like, are these all, um pasture raised non soy fed chickens you know like <laughs> they're all organic chicken yeah yeah which is um, really cool it, yeah it's super neat though because and i i know you know you and i have um keep in touch about um uh, things like like this randomly and i know with uh dr paul saladino was recently on um joe rogan's podcast and he was talking about uh and I, he's gone on a rampage about this over the last few months but um the vegetable oils they lower your cholesterol but what they've also found in other studies is they greatly increase your risk of all the things you mentioned earlier, uh, heart disease, heart attack, cancer, diabetes, um, you name it, yeah. all inflammatory disease, which is most every disease. So what's the point of having low cholesterol or why is low cholesterol, cholesterol good if, it, if to get it, we have to kill ourselves? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, that's, you know, hopefully that question answers itself. <laughs> and it's just this funny thing of um there's a cycle in our body that we, we we i don't know we gave cholesterol a bad name cholesterol is needed we need cholesterol in our body like and the cholesterol that we find in our body is produced from our liver mm -hmm. um and so when you don't eat enough cholesterol your body should create more and when you do eat enough cholesterol your body should create less and then there's this, you know homeostasis there's this balance and that's good because in winter months, you better have higher cholesterol because you're going to get more vitamin D and be able to use the sun a lot better. Yeah. Um, and when you have low cholesterol, you're and you live in a place like Pittsburgh or Seattle, um, you're going to be at higher risk of seasonal, you know, disorder um, and mood swing, like, you know, like those anxiety, yeah. depression, you know, and that's one thing. And then two, when you're you know, eating these polyunsaturated fats, you're suppressing your body's ability to create cholesterol, which is something we need. It's healthy from your liver. And you're telling your body to store fat. Mm -hmm. And then 
as a result, that fat excretes hormones that tell your brain to tell your liver to create more cholesterol. And then you get stuck in this cycle of we need to create more cholesterol, but we're suppressing that. And then we're getting more fat, which means we create more cholesterol, but we're suppressing that. And it's like, it's a, you know, you see that and you're like, okay, that's why there's this thing called metabolic syndrome. Even if you don't, like you can, there's all the inflammation and stuff too with polyunsaturated fats is basically very poisonous, but yeah, um, it throws our body into this, just this stalemate, this weird loop that it can't get out of, yeah. you know. Probably one of the best researchers I've ever seen on this whole topic is Dr. Kate Shanahan. Um, she was actually uh, earlier this year on Bill Maher to talk about, um, and I'm not a fan of Bill Maher just as a human being, but <laughs> but I'm I you know I'm a fan of anybody who's willing to give um, truth, at least on occasion, give truth a uh, a place to to be spoken on. So she uh, she's incredibly intelligent and. Kind of the way she and Dr. Saladino I've heard explain is it almost it almost tricks the body because the, the polyunsaturated fats, we're saying the word PUFA, polyunsaturated fat, they're higher in, in fats that the body can't use as energy. Um, and they're also not natural to the body. So they actually trick the body, they trick the brain into saying, whoa, we have all these calories, but there's no energy we can use from this. So we need higher blood sugar. And then it the, the brain's telling the liver and the pancreas, you better make some higher blood sugar. And the pancreas and liver are going, no, man, we're good. But the brain wins, right? Without the brain, we die. So gradually over years, we just have high, we are, we start having a higher and higher resting blood sugar. We should be like 70s, 80s. And then all of a sudden, people that are really lean and healthy looking have blood sugar of 118, 120, 130. And they can't figure out why. They've been eating all this healthy, healthy polyunsaturated fats their whole life. Well, this is what's happening, and it's literally tricking the body into slowly digressing into a diabetic state over the years. That, I mean, that is the definition of diabetes, when your blood sugar can't be controlled, and it's just high for no reason. So yes. um, that's one of the worst things that it does short short term. <laughs> yeah. yeah, insulin resistance. It's yeah. just, you know, insulin resistance and uh, messes with your hormones and it just puts you in a, a spot where you're just going to end up like the same way you would if you were, you know, eating, I don't know, candy every day. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the candy is more fun, <laughs> right? It, it at least tastes good. And you could yeah. actually grease the groove all day long and burn off a lot more of that candy than you can the polyunsaturated fats. Yeah. So. And so it's just one of those things where, you know, there's that first off. And then you talk about like gut health, um, you know, depending on what you are eating. So, you know, we're eating all these foods that isn't real food for us. So it's changing the way our gut microbiome is because we have to get new gut. Um, we're basically feeding a whole new culture of bacteria yep. that we're never were feeding before. Um, so if you look at, you know, human history and we're, you know, hunted, we've gathered, you know, we ate nuts, berries, meats, uh, whatever we could find. Even after agriculture became a thing, we we're still eating more or less whole food. It's just mm -hmm. more widely abundant. So we, we can go more plant based in that sense and still be eating food. Mm -hmm. um, and then just over time, with you know, more industrialized we've gotten. Now it's like we've gone from eating food to eating, you know, really highly refined sugars and these polyunsaturated fats and then there's all these chemicals that we can eat from like artificially sweetened foods and there's new things coming out all the time on how to you know the next you know food item that's going to save your you know be that that thing yeah and what it's just like our bodies were never had that before and it's like we're completely going to change our bacteria in our gut um which is then going to you know, impede our ability to actually get the nutrition we need from real food because we're not used to eating it anymore. And mm -hmm. it just puts us in this place where even when you do figure out the truth and you start to change things, it's going to have this lag effect of like, you actually have to purge out all of that crap that was in your body. <laughs> yeah. Because here's the thing, we make up, our body is made up of the fats we eat, right? It's made up of the protein and all these other things, but the fat really goes into making up a lot of the body. Um, and that's what people don't think. All these low-fat diets, you're not replacing things. And I'm not saying eat eat pounds of coconut oil and stuff like that. Just eat animal 
animal comes with all the fat you need. You know, you don't have to go above and beyond. Um, so if you're making sure you're getting getting um, meat throughout the week, whatever meat you like the best, uh, whatever whatever your body actually is craving in terms of meat, you can replace all the cell membranes are made up of saturated fat. The brain is saturated fat and cholesterol. If you're replacing those with fats that the body doesn't understand how to use, um, let's say the, the cell membrane is the door of your cell. And if you are putting a rusty hinge on that door, it's going to get stuck open or stuck shut or just not work right. And a fat cell has a door. <laughs> so you want to lose fat, give it the right hinge. So you got to use you got to use real fats to replace these things. Avocado oil, egg yolks, coconut oil, lard and tallow or just animals and butter. Don't forget butter, right? Real butter. Yeah, I like butter a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just eating. I, I, I had some soup yesterday, some chicken soup with homemade broth and stuff. And I literally I don't have crackers or anything anymore um, because I, my body just doesn't handle these things. And even seed and nut crackers, I don't do well with those kind of things either. I just took like a sliver of butter and I was salting it and dipping it into the soup and just eating it off the knife. It was so good. So, oh, yeah, it's, you know, I, I primarily use my butter for cooking, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just funny because it's like basically our great grandparents were right. And all these things that they started to change in our diet and that are still like, if you look at the vegan movement and you look at like all these other things that they're still trying to change in our diet, it's going down the wrong pathway. It's mm -hmm. causing a lot of problems. Yeah. And not and that so, people can't be vegan, but I mean, it's just, there's, it's a lot, not very straightforward. Yeah. I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not a fan of it. It's like, it's so much work to yeah. almost be healthy, right? Like it's a great, it's yeah. a great fasting tool, which is what most religions on the planet use vegan, uh, like a, a no animal diet for is just a short term fast. Um, but, uh, or, or long-term fast too. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing we're doing to this, to this body that we're given. Um, yeah. it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> so. oh, yeah. And I don't know, you would think that, you know, when we see all of the statistics of all these diseases increasing that we think, okay, whatever we're doing right now isn't, isn't working as a yeah. country. Uh, and that's where like there are doctors and professionals waking up and being a lot more vocal now. But it, it's just funny that you can still see politicians saying that we need to get rid of meat or tax meat, things like that. It's it's really weird. Yeah. And uh, yeah, is it Diana Rogers and, and Rob Wolf have a uh, movie coming out this, I think, December. That is uh, they they really dive into the data. And Rob Wolf is a has been a, I think he's a biochemical researcher, like a research biochemist. There we go. And the guy knows how to research. He's like Mark Sisson. He had a, you know, he was going through college as a researcher and people just think he's some super fit old guy. No, he actually has a medical background. And um, these guys like fell into this thing through health and wellness because their bodies were falling apart at a young age and uh, in their thirties. And these guys are just so good at researching the, the truth. So um, Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers have researched all about how to rebuild the soil and rebuild the earth using animals. And they've tried to research ways and find ways that you could do it without animals. And it's just not possible. It's, it's, it's so silly to think that if you're a Christian and you believe that, that animals are destroying the, the planet, you've never read the Bible. Like the, they were all given to us and given to this earth to keep the earth going, to heal it. Like, God doesn't make anything wrong. And we kind of look at it as, oh, well, clearly these cow farts, but they're going to destroy us all. What? <laughs> so. It's the funniest thing in the world. And like, I remember one of the funnest classes I took in my undergrad. Um, and I went to school in a very liberal university in Southern California and um, was ecology because I think it was like a GE class. I was the only science major in it. And I just had to like, when it came to GEs, I was like, I'm going to get easy A's. I'm just going to do what I do what I'm good at. And it was hilarious because you get so many of these people who are just not educated in science backgrounds going into ecology. And it was just like, 
man, like ecosystems exist for a reason. Like, you know, we like there there is like things do die so plants can grow. We like they eat plants, the other things eat them, and then circle of life, like Lion King yep. had it right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Lion King had it right. Quote you know? of the podcast. Yeah. Lion King had it right. And it's just it's, it's funny when we're trying to almost like play God and change that. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it, I agree. So I guess um, we'll finish this up real soon. But so we didn't totally say anything about finding what food works for you. We more or less said like, hey, guys, avoid poofas at all cost. Yeah, um, because, fix your gut. <laughs> yeah, like that alone. So so um, I'm, a, I'm a believer that if we have a healthy gut, I do believe like the Weston A. Price Foundation, the way they put up a, a diet of traditional foods and, and even breads and grains that are soaked and sprouted and fermented. Um, yeah. Dr. Kate Shanahan, same thing. And guys, if you want to learn anything about fats, go to Dr. Kate's website, drkate.com. Um, it's one of the best resources out there. She is the most up-to-date and most willing to change her viewpoint when she finds new data. Um, but if you can have a healthy gut, not a leaky gut, and if you don't have the food intolerances and food allergies that come with all these things like I do, then I think that a Weston A. Price type, um, type of diet a nourishing traditions type diet is probably the best route to go. Um, that doesn't mean eating sourdough at every meal. It just means eating it sometimes. It doesn't mean eating beans every day. And like, it means eating them sometimes a couple times a week. You know, the, we think that we think Italians eat spaghetti every meal. No, they don't. <laughs> they eat real food and they have spaghetti throughout the week. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, so I, I think I have a pretty healthy gut. I can tolerate a lot of different foods, but there's certain foods that I just, they're not foods. And I, so, and if I, I know if I keep eating them, I'll just feel terrible. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So it's being able to get quality food. Like, and you know, I think like if you're going to go for bread, be very, very careful <laughs> where you're getting yeah. your bread. Uh, maybe make it yourself. There's like, you know, people can, there's bread maker machines you can have in your yeah. house nowadays. Um. And you know, same thing with like, if you're going to even touch soy, like it better be organic and in very moderation, you know, crazy fermented. Going, yeah. Yeah. People think and, that, like Asian cultures ferment soy for like two years, you know, it's not like a short term thing. It takes a long time to eat that food. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's one of those things where it was like, Hey, if you can eat meat, vegetables, fruits, that's like fruit is okay. Like sugar is not the, not evil. Like I think yeah. I heard you earlier say honey, like honey is actually a very complex um, sugar. <laughs> yeah. It has lots of like different minerals and stuff and it has benefits. Um, and there's more research. Um, my sister-in-law is a dentist and there's a lot of benefits from honey and like propolis, it's bee pollen um, in the body specifically when it comes to fighting like gingivitis and things like that. Yeah. So like honey is actually a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't dove into it, but I've heard Dr. Dannenberg, who was a previous guest on here, and he's a big carnivore guy. He cured himself of of uh, pretty pretty uh, terrible cancer using carnivore and a few other approaches. But um, and he's seven in his seventies. Um, and I've heard him say that uh, uh, honey does not cause tooth decay. I have not looked into that enough. But I know I eat tons of honey now, and I was like zero sugar for the longest time. But I, you know, I have other problems with my body that that need worked on. So I had to go pretty low sugar of all kinds for a long time. And then my body's kind of coming out of that, and uh, I can handle honey. But guess what? I still overdo it, and all of a sudden my body slips back into feeling like crap. So yeah, it's a balance, guys. And and moderation for you is different than moderation for me. So so that's a big one as well. Um. Uh, do you have any? What do you got? Anything you want to finish up with before I show everybody where they can find you? Um, I mean, I think that we can just finish up with moderation when it comes to moderation. Like, you can have, you know, so for example, and like what moderation to me looks different to you. For example, like what that actually looks like. If someone's eating two thousand calories, their slice of pie on Thanksgiving is going to be a lot smaller than someone who's eating 7,000 calories or Mm -hmm. 5,000 calories or 4,000 calories. Um, And, you know, for if let's say you're on a 2000 calorie diet, sure, like 50 grams of sugar or less is probably where like, probably good. 
Yeah. Um, if you're on a 5,000 calorie diet, which I was on that for a few years because I used to be 180, 180 um, I was eating around 75 grams of sugar to 100 grams of sugar and I didn't blink about it, you know, yeah. and like sugar is not the bad guy. It's just comparatively to the rest of the food you're eating, how, like, how much of it is yeah. coming from X amount of this and other sources. And it's just about really finding the foods that work well for you. So like meat is obviously a really easy one. Mm -hmm. um, and red meat, which has been a bad guy for so long, is very, has so many benefits. I think of it as like, if you call an avocado a superfruit, you might as well call steak a superfruit. Oh yeah. Um, I, when I hand out papers, I hand out like the, the primal health coach, like food list. Right. And I tell people every time, like, yeah, we always hear these Bilboa fruits or whatever, and acais are all superfoods. I said, I'm not from Africa. Why does that matter to me? And I, I put a line next to every animal on the list, and I go, these are superfoods. <laughs> because they, they are everywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. So everybody is nourished from these. Simple. Yeah. yeah, it's the, what food is, like, when especially nowadays that we're all from different continents now and everything like that, it's like, in our genetics are very mixed and you know, it's, it's a great thing. And, um, when it comes like what foods work for most people, it's meat, uh, works for most people mm -hmm. and fruit, I guess, works for most people too, in yeah. moderation. And then everything else it's like, man, like spinach and kale might not work very well for you. Yeah. Do you want to wreck my gut? The re <laughs> reason I went carnivore two years ago was because I wrecked yeah. my gut with spinach and kale trying to detox for way too long. Yeah. Wrecked. And like, for me personally, I find my body works very well in like a traditional North African diet. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> like, like, you know, meat and potatoes, like great. Yeah, uh, and that's pretty much like I'm like meat and honey and uh, and like a little bit of a little bit of squashes here and there, you know? Yeah. And that's where like nutrition doesn't have to be that hard. It just has yeah. to be find the foods that you like that work well for you that are mm -hmm. real food and eat them and then go from there. So, Jordan, um. Do you, if anybody here that's listening really likes what they hear um, and likes, they, they feel like they mesh well with you, do you have any openings currently right now for coaching? I'm sorry, I think I lost you for a second. Yeah. Do you have any, co uh, any coaching openings right now? So I actually, I do for my, the way my coaching works is I have a, like a front end three week program, mm -hmm. which is just to jumpstart people into the right direction. Nice. And then if it makes sense from there, some people go through that jumpstart program, that's all they needed. And then they're off to the races on their that's own. Awesome. Uh, some people, they get jump started, and then we really have to, you know, work together for a whole year after, but it's, you know, going into this completely um, more sustainable way of life and living. Um, but yeah, so I think you just pulled up my, my website right there. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, you know, linked in my Facebook and in my Instagram. I, I pretty much live on social media with Instagram and Facebook. It's like my business front. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if you just send me a message, if you know, on Facebook or Instagram, or you go ahead and book a call with me through my you know, website here, we'll start talking about, you know, what's going on, figure out, you know, I'm going to ask a million questions to get to know mm -hmm. where they're at. And that jumpstart program is very much a calibration. It's like, Hey, this is some solid things like sleep, water, uh, protein, and, you know, exercise, the basics and being able to calibrate how they're doing on the basics. And a lot of people, it's the biggest problem is that they haven't mastered the basics and they're trying things like keto or they haven't mastered the basics and they're trying to do intermittent fasting. They haven't yeah. you know, mastered the basics and they're trying to go vegan. And it's like, you know, it's just, and it's not working. And it's because you have to start again at the white belt level um, when it comes to transforming your life specifically, if you want it to be long-term transformation. So yeah, my website, um, which you just showed and, my social media there, it's, you know, just Jordan, Coach Jordan Writing at Instagram and then just Jordan Writing on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, and I have Steel Body Fitness, Fitness but I know you have Jordan, uh, Jordan yeah. Writing on as well. And they both pretty much have all the same information, which is great. So, guys, I definitely say reach out to him and just um, follow follow Jordan and see what the heck he's up to because he just has uh, – he has great information here. The, the one in particular, I love this uh, on your Instagram page. 
I think I would probably put the sleep down even lower um, as more of a base, but I get where you're going at there. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have put the sleep down there for most of my life. And now it, it, I realize how terrible my day is with, with poor sleep. <laughs> Yeah, sleep is one of those things where, I mean, just stress in general. Stress is probably, like, we talked about PUFAs and the effect of PUFAs. We talked about sugar a little bit and the effect mm -hmm. of that. Um, but stress is probably, like, if it's the three, you know, horsemen of the of the uh, metabolic apocalypse, um, it would be, <laughs> stress would be another one. And yeah. not sleeping, not eating enough, working out too often, too much, and working too often, too much is all just causing stress on yeah. your body. Yeah, that, and this Saturday, if anybody's available, I think it's all booked up, but out at Lampost Farms in Ohio, I'm going to be doing a talk on um, a little workshop on um, a lot of what we talked about today with inflammation and how to reduce inflammation in the body and what inflammation does to the gut, to the body, to the brain, and everything from EMFs to just having shoes on every day of your life, to not getting sunshine, to having poor sleep, um, and to PUFAs. That's going to be the biggest one there. But um, I'll have a bunch of EMF meters to, to show people in person what what actually is coming off of your cell phone? Turn your cell phone off at night, you know? So, um, in a different room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. Um, so it's, it's just, it's gonna be fun to show people really in the moment how serious these, these, uh, these things are in the body. So uh, that's an easy one to show. The, the poofas are hard to show, right? It's just, uh, um, yeah. but guys, if you're eating food and if you're normally a buck 60 like I am, and you are normally paleo and you eat something that's a paleo food and all of a sudden you're six pounds up the next day. Something you ate wasn't food for you. I just recently had a cassava flour tortilla and I gained four pounds overnight, four or five pounds. Like, and it hasn't come off yet because I'm allergic. I mean, well, I have a gluten intolerance or, or allergy. I don't know which. Um, and there's cross, it's a cross, uh, what do they call it? Cross, con not cross contamination, but it's your body sees those proteins as gluten and it reacts the yeah. same way. Cross reactivity. So yeah. cassava and tapioca starch, no good for me. So, yeah. And that's where, yeah, that's like, that's basically how you find food that works for your gut. <laughs> it, right it, there. Be strict. And when you sway a little bit, if it's okay. And after swaying a little bit with the same, same type of food for a few days, if nothing happens, probably food for you. If in if within three to five days of eating a food, um, I should say one to three days of eating a food, if you if things change, if you get stuffy nose, if you get runny nose, if you have bad stool, if you uh, constipated diarrhea, whatever it is, if you get moody, if you get rashes, that's not food for you. If you go up and wait for no reason at all, that's not food for you. Yeah. And then do you mind if I do a little plug real quick too? Oh, heck yeah, man. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. So uh, this Friday, I so I have a Facebook group. It's a completely free Facebook group. There's like yeah. 315 members in it right now. Um, and I'm constantly, I go live in there a lot more often. I'm constantly giving away, uh, not giving away, but like just giving, helping people with, with like coaching people for basically for free, just for mm -hmm. being in that group. Um, and there's like free workouts, follow along workouts. There's all kinds of stuff in there. And I am doing a Zoom call that it's an event in that group. So if you go just to my profile and join that group and then click that RSVP to the event, um, you join the Zoom room this Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. So that's, you know, I have some people on the, I, I think all of your following is probably on the East Coast, right? <laughs> yeah, for the, I mean, a lot of them are, yeah. So yeah, 7 p.m. Eastern and we're diving into metabolism and it's just a basic overview of, a lot of the stuff we talked about today, but just also more, um, it's just how to take care of your metabolism and why, like there's all the misconceptions about what metabolism is. So it's just a little, it's a live interactive training, which I'm, you know, going to be asking for Q and A's, things like that and have a lot prepared, but, uh, it's going to be a super valuable training on just basically everything you need to know about metabolism. Nice. Um, and then I see that being as, if, you know, something that I'm going to be teaching on like probably once a month on um, and going into a lot more of like, all right, so if you find that your metabolism isn't where you want it to be, how do we fix that? And like reverse dieting and different, different more things like that. But we're just starting with the basic intro of like, Hey, um, what is your metabolism? Actually, it's not like some engine in your body. It's, yeah. you know, it's like, 
It's a lot more complex than that. And yeah, it's just not about burning fat. The metabolism does no. a lot of things. Yeah, it's it does. It basically is every process in your body mm -hmm. summed together is your metabolism. And so I'm just going to be giving a complete like in-depth training on metabolism and answering questions in my group. And we're doing that over a Zoom training, which I will record and will be in that database for nice. members. But yeah, if people want to be in there and ask questions and learn, um, join my Facebook group. It's this Friday at 7 p.m. Yeah. And what's the, where, um, I'm looking at, uh, so I'm on Steel Body Fitness LLC. Is that where they can join the Facebook group? Uh, so it's Mind Body Spirit Fitness Community Group, or that's okay. the name of the Facebook group. And there is, like, if you go to my personal profile on Facebook, um, there's a link on the left under like my information where it says free community. Um, or if you click on my, like banner on my Facebook profile and you see, see more, it says click here to join the free community. Um, okay. So here, let me, uh, I brought it up now. Let me share this. So it is, uh, right here underneath. Yeah. So this is your, your personal page, which is again, uh, you do a good job at making both of them. So it's jordan.riding.nine on Facebook. If you, if you struggle to find it, but you'll be able to see that. So right there, the free community, huh? Yep. Yeah. You can join that. Um, just answer a couple of quick questions, get in that group and then get in the metabolic training on Friday. Awesome. And I have that linked in our, uh, in the show notes as well. That's already up for the, for the, uh, for this interview right now. So. Perfect. Yeah, Heck yeah. So Jordan, thank you so much, man. This flew by, this was fun. I, I mean, we easily talked for, for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we could easily go for another, I feel like, uh, and we'll definitely have to, you know, do this again sometime. Yeah. A part two would be terrific, man. So. All right, Mike. Uh, thanks for, you know, yeah. Putting this together, man. And I, you know, we'll yeah. And hang, okay. hang on one minute. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll end the broadcast here and, uh, thank you everybody for tuning in and watching. Thanks for everybody for chiming in as well. Um, always appreciate it. So have a great one.